our almighty God and our heavenly Father. You have heard every whisper, every syllable, every word. You know the burdens on our hearts, the cares that are on our minds. You know the opportunities that each one of us has and the difficulties and achieving them. You know those for whom we are so concerned and so we come and cast our cares on you because you care for us. And Lord, may we now trust you. We pray that you would be with our friends and Israel. Bless them and keep them safe, keep them healthy. We pray, Lord, for our nation that you would bring to us a great hurricane of revival that will spread across our land. And we pray, Heavenly Father, also we would be remiss if we didn't remember those submariners that are in such desperate straits tonight. And Father, we pray if it's possible they would be delivered. And in any event, Lord, we pray that someone on that submarine would know enough of the gospel to share it with the others. And Father, we pray that you would bless those who are seeking to care for them and to reach them. And all of our emergency responders, our police officers, our fire firefighters, and, and our leaders of our nation, Lord, we are all standing in the need of prayer. And so we come to you with these things and give them to you and trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. All of the world has been gripped by this submarine, which so ironically is in crisis near the ruins of the Titanic. And all of us are so grateful we are here tonight and not in that vessel that is trapped seven miles below the sea, running out of oxygen, claustrophobic, we can't imagine the terror. But the fact is, it really is a microcosm of our whole world. Our entire globe is running out of oxygen. We're in a state of hopelessness, except we have a savior. Amen. And that savior has a day in his life, which I think we could call the greatest day that ever was. And it's the greatest day for all of us. When my grandson Elijah was five or six years old, his dad took him out to Radnor Lake and they went hiking. And it was the, you can't, you can't believe how excited Elijah was. And he was sort of obsessed with various birds and owls. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, the very kind of owl that he wanted to see came down and just lit on something in front of them looked at them, and then flew away. And he came back home, and his mom said, how was your trip? He said, this was my greatest day yet. <laughs> well, what has been your greatest day yet? In all of your life, what would be your greatest day? In fact, our greatest day occurred before we were ever born. It occurred on that Sunday morning when Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And Luke gives us a very good accounting of it in the book of Luke chapter 24. And I just want to walk through this with you. It is my favorite passage of scripture, especially the middle part of the chapter is my favorite Bible story. And I just had a real urge to share this. And so if you'll follow me, let's begin with what happened on the morning of that resurrection day. It said on the first day of the week, that's the way the chapter begins. Now, it's very interesting, isn't it, that nowhere in the New Testament do we read the words, don't worship on Saturday anymore, but worship on Sunday. We're not given that commandment in the Bible. And yet, after the resurrection of Christ, people began worshiping on Sunday. What happened on Easter was so dynamic, it was so transforming. It was so overwhelming to everybody that just naturally they got together on that first of the week every week to celebrate what had happened. Now these were Jewish people who for the last 1400 years had been worshiping on Saturday and all of a sudden the early church began worshiping on Sunday as a rule. They worshiped all week long 
but they would meet together and they called it the Lord's Day. Something dramatic must have happened. They changed the worship habits of these early Jewish believers. It says, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, he has risen. I wish I knew who those angels were. They aren't named, but they had the happiest duty in all of angelic history. The Lord's birth was celebrated by the angels who sang, but his resurrection was also celebrated by these angels. Angels populate the Bible. They are all the way through beginning with Genesis and going to Revelation. There's an unseen world that we can't see, angels and demonic spirits everywhere. But the angels are just as busy right now as they were in biblical times. They are helping us more than we know. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1, are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? We never know when an angel has helped us. I think when we get to heaven, we'll be living side by side with the angels. We'll come to know them very well. And these two were especially privileged because to them was given the privilege of saying, he is not here, he is risen. Why do you seek the living among the dead? I know a man who tried to find his brother's grave about a year after he had buried his brother. And it was raining. And he went into the cemetery and he couldn't find the right place and he was getting drenched and he was sad and upset. And he began to weep. And all of a sudden, those words came to him. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He said, my brother's not here, he's alive. He's just as alive as he ever was and more so. And those words are so wonderful to give comfort to us when we go through a time of grief. We don't need to seek the living among the dead. They are alive in Christ. And so this was the message of the angels. And it says, do you not remember what he told you when he was in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinners. Notice the word must, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. And then they remembered his words. He told them this over and over again during the last few months of his ministry, but it never really penetrated because it was so incongruous to them that it could possibly be true. But now they remembered. When they came back from the tomb, they told all of these things to the eleven, and to the others, and now we have a little inventory of who it was. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Remember, even the 11 were cynics and skeptical at this time. It would have taken absolute empirical, irrefutable proof to have convinced them that Jesus was alive. But verse 11 says, they did not believe the women, but Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. Now, the fact that the shroud was laying flat on the slab of the tomb is very instructive. It means that Jesus just vaporized and rose out of it in some supernatural way that we can't fully understand. He was resurrected bodily and physically, but his body was no longer like it had been. It had been glorified. In the Bible, we have the accounts of eight different people who came back to life after they had been, after they had died. And Jesus you know, was involved with that too. He raised up the uh, daughter of Jairus and uh, the widow, the son of the widow of Nain, and uh, Peter brought Dorcas back. But those people were not really resurrected. They were resuscitated. They came back from the dead, but they were not glorified. Their bodies continued to age 
and they got sick again and eventually they died. I don't know if being resurrected like that is really a good thing or not because you have to go through the process of dying twice. But when Jesus rose from the dead, he rose in a glorified state that will never age, never get old, never have any more sickness, never have any more pain, and it is indestructible. And that's the way our bodies will be. He had the ability to go through the clothes. He went right through the tomb. They didn't roll the stone away so Jesus could get out. They rolled the stone away so the people could get in to see that he was no longer there. And he would vanish. We'll see that in a few minutes. And he would appear again. And the Bible says in Philippians chapter 3 that when he comes again, we will be transformed so that our bodies will be like his glorious body. John said, when he comes again, we will see him and we will be like him for we will see him as he is. I don't think we fully, if we really understood that or thought about it very much, we would very seldom be sad about anything. It's such a glorious anticipation we have. And so, uh, so the disciples were trying to process all of this. So that was what happened in the morning. Now in the afternoon, we have this wonderful story, my favorite in all of the Bible. Verse 13, now that same day, two of them, Two of the disciples, two followers of Jesus, were going to a village called Emmaus. We have not located Emmaus to a 100% degree of certainty. Uh, it, you know, that some of that area was so wiped out by the Romans and then by the Crusaders and then by the Ottomans and by all of the other civilizations that archaeologists are just now locating where some of these towns were. I have a desire to walk from Jerusalem to Emmaus one day and sort of to reenact this walk, but we're not exactly sure where the town was, but it was about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened, and as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus came and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. Now, why? When Jesus appeared to two of his disciples, we could say, in disguise. I mean, if I came up here to speak tonight and I was wearing a disguise, and you thought, who is that behind that disguise? I don't know him. Is that Pastor Jackson? Is that Ben Carson? Who is it behind? Why would I do that? Why would anybody preach a sermon when they were disguised? Well, there's a very good reason why Jesus did not allow them to recognize him, and we'll come across it a little bit later. He said to them, what were you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. Sometimes our faces are downcast. If they had realized how close they were to the risen Jesus Christ, they wouldn't have been downcast. If we would realize how close we are to the risen Christ every single moment of every single day, we wouldn't be as likely to be downcast. And so it says their faces were downcast and one of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? Well, of course, he knew very well what had happened. But he was asking questions to draw them out. If you want to have a good talk with your children or somebody else, then learn to ask questions that will draw them out when they are ready to be drawn out. And these people wanted to talk. They needed to ventilate about this. So they said about Jesus of Nazareth. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all of the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. You can hear the pathos in their voices. And what is more, it is the third day since all of this took place. And in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb. 
and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. There had not yet been a sighting reported to them, even though they were with the said Jesus at that very moment. And he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer? Now remember earlier over in verse seven, the son of man must suffer. The son of man, it says here, the Messiah had to suffer these things and then enter into his glory. Here Jesus called himself the Mashiach, the Messiah, the anointed one. And he said, if you'll read the Old Testament and read it correctly, you will find that it was inevitable that the Messiah would suffer like this. It was predicted, it is woven into everything in the Old Testament. And look at verse number 27, beginning with Moses, which is what? Genesis. Beginning with Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The Torah, those first five books of the Bible written by Moses, that's where Jesus began. And he started talking about what the Old Testament said about himself. It says he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures. And when you see the word scriptures in the New Testament, it means the Old Testament. So it says he explained to them what was said about him in all of the Old Testament. I wish I could have heard that sermon. I wish that they had recorded it. I think one day when we get to heaven, we'll say, Jesus, can you tell us what you told those two disciples on the road to Emmaus? And he might say, well, I started with Genesis 3.15, where it says that there is coming a Messiah who will have his hill bruised, but he will crush the head of the serpent. And then I might take them to the book of Genesis chapter 22, where Abraham took his only beloved son to be a burnt offering on Mount Moriah, Jerusalem. And there the boy carried on his own back up that hill the wood on which he was to be sacrificed. And he was willing, but he couldn't do what only the Messiah could do. So the Lord chose a lamb instead. And he might say, speaking of that lamb, do you remember in Exodus chapter 15, when the, or chapter 12, when the Passover came and the death angel swept over Egypt? But I said, if you will take a lamb and slay it and take the blood and then put it on the doorpost, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Amen. And then he said, you remember what I told Abraham? that in you and in your seed, all of the world will be blessed. Well, I am that seed that the world was waiting for. And then he might have taken them to Genesis 22. There's a lot of passages in between that he could stop that. But in Genesis chapter 22, we have this incredible picture, depiction of crucifixion a thousand years before Jesus faced it. Personally, and it begins by saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it talks about how he would be stretched out and how he would be stripped and how he would be whipped and how the nails would go into his hand and how the people would stand around him and say, you delivered others, try to deliver yourself and how the soldiers would cast lots for his clothing and then how he would rise again and see his generation after all. Amen. And then... Maybe he took them into the prophets. Well, we know he did here because it says so. And no doubt he would have taken them to the book of Isaiah, the fifth gospel we sometimes call it. And he would have said, who do you think it was talking about when it says, for unto you a child is born, unto you a child is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And he undoubtedly went to Isaiah 53 that very deep and pensive passage that says he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. He opened not his mouth. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. 
And it goes on to say, then he rose. He will live and see the progress of his work and see the multitudes that will be redeemed and atoned for by his message and by his death. And then he might have gone to the book of Micah, chapter 5, and told them, look, I was even born in Bethlehem. What I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, is that if I didn't have a New Testament, if I didn't have Matthew through Revelation, if someone took it away from me, I could spend the rest of my life telling you everything there is to know about Jesus Christ, his conception of a virgin, his childhood, his life, his ministry, where he lived, where he came from, where he went, his personality, his manner of teachings, his miracles, his death, his resurrection, his betrayal, his everything. I could tell you everything just from the pages of the Old Testament. This is a tremendous apologetic. If you ever have doubts that Jesus is who he really says he was, or if you want to know for sure that the Bible is true, just study the messianic prophecies of Jesus, over 300 specific prophecies, as well as all of these what we call types, such as the Passover lamb and Jacob's ladder and the pole that they put the snake on. Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. These are objects and people and places. And the Bible says that he would be born of the seed of Abraham, of the seed of David, of the seed of Solomon. In fact, the story of the Old Testament isn't so much just a story of the nation of Israel as it is a story of the very unique family line that would produce the Messiah. So he began, what a message. I don't know how he got it all in in the couple of hours it took to go seven miles, but it says, finally, as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, stay with us for it is nearly evening that is almost here. So he went in to stay with them, and when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it. I mean, he walked in and suddenly he was the host. That was his, that was just how it was with him. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. He just disappeared. With his new glorified body, he was able to do that. Now, let me go back to my question. Why then did Jesus spend most of that time in an unrecognizable form, in disguise as it were? Well, here is the reason. Very simple if you think about it. He wanted them to be absolutely convinced of his resurrection, not on the basis of their visual confirmation of it, not on the basis of empirical evidence, but on the basis of the perfect way in which he had fulfilled every single prophecy in the Old Testament. And only after they were totally convinced by his ex explanation of his fulfillment of the prophecy did he reveal himself empirically. Because, I mean, you and I cannot see him right now. He's up in heaven. One day we'll see him face to face. We don't see him right now, but we don't have to see him to be convinced because we have the fulfillment of Messianic prophecy. And these two disciples were so thoroughly convinced he was alive that by the time he revealed himself, they already knew the truth of the resurrection simply because they now understood better the Old Testament scriptures. And it says in verse number 32, they asked him, were not our hearts burning within us as he talked with us on the way and opened the scriptures to us? It's wonderful, isn't it? When our hearts burn within us as we study the Bible. And they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem and there they found the 11 and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. And then the two what told what had happened to them on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread as he had by the Sea of Galilee and in the upper room. So that is the afternoon. Finally, here is the evening. While they were still talking about this, 
Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. One of the last things he had said before he was crucified was, Let not your hearts be troubled. Peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. My peace. And now the first thing he said after the resurrection was, Peace. The Lord wants us to live in a peace that is based on his resurrection. Because he has risen from the dead, everything else is going to work out all right. Amen. Verse 37, they were startled and frightened thinking they had seen a ghost. And he said to them, why are you troubled? I think that if we could hear the Lord Jesus say that to us, here you're wringing your hands, you're worried about something, upset about something. And Jesus said, why are you troubled? Before I died, I said, let not your hearts be troubled. And then I died to make sure everything was going to be all right with you in the long run. And I rose again to guarantee it. So why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me. And see, a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. Now, the fact that Jesus rose corporally in a physical body is why I am so certain that heaven is a physical, literal place. It's a new heaven, a new earth that's described for us in Revelation 21 and 22, but it's not just a vaporous, invisible sort of place. It's got to be a physical, literal place because Jesus rose again physically and literally. And we're going to rise again physically and literally. And if we are physically and literally raised again and glorified to be like Jesus was, we need a physical, literal place to live in. And so he said here, I want you to, to just touch my hands, touch my feet, touch my side and see. And then he said to them, do you have anything here to eat? That's sort of funny, really. I mean... I have teenagers that come to my house. And the first thing they say when they come in is, do you have anything here to eat? Well, Jesus, I don't think, was hungry, but he wanted to give them a further demonstration of how perfectly physical he was. And so they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. And he said, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must, and there is that word again, be fulfilled that is written about me and the law of Moses, that is the first part of the Old Testament, and the prophets, the last part of the Old Testament, and the Psalms in the middle of the Old Testament. And then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scripture. The psalmist said, Lord, open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy word. And whenever we open this book and pick it up, it's a good thing to say, Lord, open my eyes, open my heart to understand what you want to say to me today. And then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scripture. And he told them, this is what is written. The Messiah shall suffer and rise from the dead on the, th and rise from the, dead on the third day. And repentance and the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name in all nations beginning in Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send to you what my father has promised, but stay in the city of Jerusalem until you've been clothed with power from on high, referring to the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Now, we call the Great Commission that statement in which Jesus commissions us to go into all of the world. It was given five times near the end of each one of the Gospels and at the beginning of the book of Acts. Three of those times come from this evening. Jesus must have spoken much longer to them. I'm sure he did than we have the record of. Because Mark said that on that evening, when Jesus appeared to his 11 disciples, he told them to go into all of the world and to preach the Gospel to every creature. And... Luke says here, he says, go into all of the world and preach repentance 
for the forgiveness of sins and my name starting in Jerusalem. And then John said on that same night, he said, as my father has sent me, so send I you. Three of the five great commissions were involved in this message that he gave them on the night that he rose from the dead. And then later he appeared to them on a mountain in Galilee, and that's when Matthew recorded his great commission. All authority has been given unto me both in heaven and on earth, and therefore go into all of the world and make disciples. And then in Acts, right before he ascended to heaven, he said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world. In other words, during the 40 days that our Lord lingered on this earth after his resurrection and before his ascension, one thing was on his mind. That his disciples, like you and me, being thoroughly convinced that he in fact has risen from the dead, will take that message to all of the world. And then with that, he went to heaven. So this is the greatest day that ever was. This is the day that really changes everything, and all of us can do our part in winning others to the Lord. I have a very good friend, Bill Jones, Dr. Bill Jones, who was at Georgia Tech University. He wasn't a Christian, but he was staying with, and his, his roommates worked for Campus Crusade for Christ. And his mother became very sick. She went into the hospital and he rushed to see her. And she said, I think I'm gonna die and I don't know the Lord. How do I get to know the Lord? And Bill said, I don't know, but I'll find out. And he got in his car, went back to the dormitory, found the four spiritual laws laying on a table there, that little track that the Campus Crusade people lead to use people to Christ. He rushed back to the hospital. He read it all to her. She prayed that prayer at the end. She was gloriously converted and he wasn't even a saved man. But later, his roommates led him to Christ. Now, if he could lead his mother to Christ when he himself wasn't even saved, the Lord might be able to do something with us along those lines. When I was in Jerusalem earlier this year, I had my grandson, Elijah, with me. And we were at the empty tomb, the garden tomb, outside of the Damascus Gate. Some of you have been there. We were there last of all. Nobody else was around. The lights were low. The sun was down. The footpaths were on. And there was a gentle glow coming from the tomb. And I took Elijah and we walked into that empty tomb that some people think is actually the resurrection place of Jesus. And it was a very special moment. And as we walked out, this thought came to me. Because this tomb is empty. My life is full. Amen. Because the tomb is empty, we have fullness of peace, fullness of joy, fullness of faith, fullness of life, and God is with us. And just as he walked by these two men on the road to Emmaus, so by the Holy Spirit, he goes with us now everywhere we go. He is with you. You may not always recognize it, but by the Holy Spirit, he is around you. He is within you. And everything in our life, all of our joy, all of our peace, all of the power we have, all of our ability to overcome the addictions and the challenges we face, all of this comes from the greatest day that ever was. It comes out of the empty tomb of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's... That's why we say, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living. Well, let's stand together for our prayer. If there is anyone here and you don't have a close relationship with the Lord Jesus and you'd like to talk to someone, then I'll be here at the front afterwards. I'll be glad to talk to you. Some of the other ministers will as well. But don't leave here without knowing in your heart that Jesus is Lord and that he is your Lord. And now, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the greatest day that ever was. We've put ourselves in the place of those women at the tomb. 
those two travelers to Emmaus, those 11 disciples, and the empty room with the door closed when Jesus showed up. And we say, may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ through the blood of the everlasting covenant, equip us with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Amen.